Thank you very much, Heather. Um, you will probably notice that uh, this is not the panel that's advertised uh, in, in the program, so I'm happy to make a, a slight explanation before I start. Um, unfortunately, um, Daphne Gilbert's not able to be with us. She's sick this afternoon. And uh, wonderfully, Professor Jackman and Professor Nathan have agreed to step up to the plate and provide us with some feedback and commentary. Um, before, however, I get to introducing uh, our main speaker, uh, I do have a, our only major speaker, uh, I do have a couple comments. Um, first of all, it's a, a real pleasure for me to be here. It's been a really interesting day. And as a litigator, it's often really essential for us to kind of come up from the trenches and repair the often fragmented view of the charter that we get. Um, as litigators, we uh, tend to know the piece of the charter and the particular line of reasoning that we need to know uh, for the case. And we lose sight of the grand flow of things um, as the charter uh, progresses. Uh, for me, it's also particularly timely, this, because, um, as you may be aware, um, the immigration and refugee bar is currently facing a major challenge, uh, a constitutional challenge, uh, which is essentially a concerted attack on refugees uh, with the mandatory detention of refugee uh, and asylum seekers in Canada, which in our view is clearly um, unconstitutional, it's arbitrary, and there's no possibility of review. Um, and being uh, inflicted upon a severely uh, disadvantaged and vulnerable group uh, of people seeking refuge in Canada. Um, Janet Miner this morning uh, spoke to us about step one, which is the policy review step in terms of the impact of the Charter. And in this case, it's very hard for us to fathom what possible legal opinion the Department of Justice could have provided to the Minister of Immigration on the constitutionality of this legislation. So unless the courts are prepared to do a complete volt force on liberty protections in this country uh, under Section 7, it's hard to imagine that this case, which we are preparing for, is going to be argued on anything but Section 1. So the questions raised this morning and throughout the day about the quality of the evidence and the burden on the uh, and the burden on the government and a rational connection are going to be key for us in this litigation. So um, this is particularly true where we have not really had evidence-based debates in Parliament but really ideologically based debates, so it's going to be very challenging and interesting to see what the courts do in the face of evidence. So hats off to the students in the Ottawa Law Review. As I said, for me, this has been a really interesting day, very timely, with lots of things to think about as we move forward on our litigation. Um, I'd like uh, now just to move to um, an introduction of Ritu Cooler. Uh, Carissima, Ritu, and I uh, go back quite a long ways. Uh, I was on the National Legal Committee of LEAF when we litigated you and Chuck. Uh, Carissima was a director of litigation, and Ritu was one of our counsel. So it's been a pleasure for me to reestablish that contact again. Uh, Ritu graduated in 1991 from the University of Toronto. She clerked in the Alberta courts and has practiced in a number of firms specializing in human rights and constitutional law over the years. She's been a lecturer in constitutional law and labor arbitration at the University of Alberta and is currently on the board of the Center for Constitutional Studies and the Alberta Law Reform Institute, both of which are at the University of Ottawa. She's Oh, Alberta, sorry. Not <laughs> She's also um, been involved in a number of significant equality court, uh, rights uh, uh, litigation, uh, normally acting for interveners, except in the Mackay Panos case, uh, which dealt with uh, whether obesity is a disability and whether Air Canada has obligations to accommodate. I'll just name a few of the cases that she's been involved with. Vreen, where she acted for the United Church of Canada, R versus Mill for the Mills, the Sexual Assault Center of Alberta, and as I mentioned, Ewan Chuck for Leaf, 
and R versus shearing also for Lee. So I'll give you a two. Um, what I thought I'd do today in my, um, as the sole panelist, and thank you for Carissa and, uh, and Martha for, for joining me up here so it's not a complete solo show, is to explain why um, the paper that I will produce for the uh, publication will not be called um, A Feminist and Egalitarian View of Section 1, but it will be uh, called something like um, Oak's Influence Outside the Charter. And, um, the way I get there, um, as I was explaining to Chantal and we were chatting about the panel um, a few days ago, is um, I took my lead from um, Harry Potter. Um, and I hope that most of you have read Harry Potter or have you know, read it to your children or they've told you about it. But uh, in book four, Harry Potter participates in a Triwizard Tournament. Um, and uh, he has to go combat a dragon. and. He's taken aside by one of his professors to give, give some advice on how to do this, Alistair Moody, the, the fake Alistair Moody. But um, the advice he got was play to your strengths. What are you good at? That's how you have to use to fight the dragon. And not that this room is a dragon, but, but my strengths are just practicing. Um, I was a bit intimidated by uh, being invited to this conference. And when I started to review uh, the literature in section one and section 15, there's been a lot written. Um, I don't feel like I can contribute really to some of uh, the sophistication of the analysis out there. So I'm going to play to my strengths and talk about what I know, um, which is um, the reality of practicing in this area. So I'd like to make, explain in five points how I get from um, an egalitarian feminist uh, perspective on section one to the influence of Oaks outside the charter. First, I want to start with the Oaks test itself. Oaks, um, We've heard lots about the test, and I'll tell you from my perspective, I think it's a brilliant, elegant test. It is, um, it is a test that's flexible. It's a test that can be explained and used uh, when you're actually advocating. Um, people understand it. It's not always applied well in terms of um, how rigorous it's being applied and the evidentiary requirements, but it's a test that makes sense in a lot of contexts to judges and sometimes to administrative tribunals, um, decision makers who wouldn't necessarily have a lot of familiarity of day-to-day -day dealing with uh, constitutional law and the Oaks test. <coughs> Some of the limitations in the Oaks test and the application of the Oaks test have been talked about already today. And one of the recent cases that I was struck by was the Hunterite uh, driver's license case where I was shocked by the outcome uh, based on the Oaks analysis. I assumed um, that there was no way that would um, uh, pass uh, a section one test, the requirement for how to rights in Alberta to the four or five hundred of them to have their photos taken for the driver's license. And when you read the analysis of the majority versus uh, the dissent, um, the, the, I think the, the weakness of the majority analysis becomes uh, apparent. So having decided that uh, the Oaks test is good, I thought, okay, now what do I do? So the second point that I want to talk about is you know, what's a, I was trying to think of what's a feminist view of section one, and well, let's talk about equality rights. And then I got into a problem. How can I talk about section 15? Because I don't really understand it anymore. <laughs> I used to understand it, I thought, uh, when it was Andrews. And it just keeps changing, and I'm not sure it really, um, um, every refinement um, that you put parts to bring simplicity and clarification just really confuses me more. Um, I don't know, is law in, is law out, what are the contextual factors? Um, so how can I talk about section 15? And quite frankly, I avoid section 15 um, at all costs in terms of litigating. If we have charter issues, um, we try and um, locate them in a different right. They locate them in freedom of expression or freedom of religion, where there's still an analytical framework that makes sense to me. You know, the, the claimant can prove the breach, and then the government has to, to justify it under Section 1. Um, it, it's, um, you have the practical problems of Section 15, which have been alluded to. 
um, where the onus is put on the claimant to prove the relevancy of, um, uh, the, to, to deal with the Section 1 analysis when you're trying to prove the breach of the right. And quite frankly, most claimants um, don't have the resources to do that. Um, I was going to say that, um, uh, in my opinion, remarks, I forgot, Justice Stratus had commented about um, how cases come before the courts and uh, uh, the paid lawyers making the arguments and it's a form of commercial free expression. Most lawyers acting for claimants in Section 15 cases are doing a pro bono, so I don't know whether that changes our freedom <laughs> and gives our more, us more credibility or less credibility, um, but it's clearly not paid. And it becomes more of an issue when you're looking at having to retain experts. And um, the, the burden put on claimants is, um, is very difficult when you don't understand what the law is, uh, what the tests the court will be applying, what kind of evidence are you supposed to put forward, then the government's going to put something forward, and is it going to be different than the have to call reply evidence? I mean, it's, it's um, a nightmare to actually litigate. I was trying to think of the last time I actually used Section 15, and there were a couple of times that ended up um, not in cases, that once we filed um, the uh, pleadings, um, it actually settled. Uh, but there were very clear, crisp cases of discrimination. Um, you know, one was involving the denial of, it was actually um, an expression case more than a equality case, the denial of press credentials to the APEC conference um, for somebody from an alternative magazine. Um, but the other one that was an equality case actually was with the federal civil servitude um, it was an Acadian background that did not want to take the oath to the Queen. Um, and the adverse impact of that uh, take, requirement to take the oath. And uh, he was about to be fired because of his refusal to take the oath. And once we filed our pleadings, they backed away and he, they said they would look at changing the oath and I actually don't know what they, came, they ever did. But, you know, it's in very clear cases um, that you can maybe, uh, it's easier to make a Section 15 argument. But that leads to, um, um, the, I think another point on the, the equality cases is that it's, um, this is my third point, is that they're more complex. The, the um, egregious discrimination cases, I think, have been litigated um, to, to a large degree, and now the types of cases that we're dealing with are the uh, benefits cases or more subtle nuanced forms of discrimination that are harder to get traction and then harder to, uh, to, to prove. When we do litigate equality issues, we use human rights legislation as much as possible. And, and that's my, my third point in terms of litigating equality. Um, even in, in the public sector, a large part of my practice now is a labor law practice, um, union side labor law. And so even though I represent a number of public sector unions, we'll just use human rights legislation. The, the test for discrimination there is still relatively straightforward. The law is well developed. We're trying to resist the efforts of some to say that the discrimination analysis of human rights should be the same as Section 15. And there's a large body of academic commentary on this issue. And um, it's um, something I know I'm resisting quite um, in a case right now. And, and just to give you the picture, you know, in an administrative tribunal of lay people, I'm arguing a discrimination case in terms of the application of their uh, framework. It's a disciplinary hearing um, for um, a health professional um, who has an addiction and who's being punished for the conduct uh, as a result of the addiction. And so we're saying, well, this person had addiction is an illness, um, and the insight case affirms that by the Supreme Court of Canada. And so you have a duty to accommodate, you can deal with the issues in a non disciplinary manner. So we're not challenging the legislation, just saying you're not exercising um, your discretion in how to deal with this person, consistent with human rights obligations, in a lay panel. And so the other side is arguing, oh, we, you know, I've got the discrimination test wrong. You've got to look at, uh, you have to look at the charter and bringing in law and cap and now be Whitler and just confusing the heck out of this lay panel. And, and uh, it's very hard to argue discrimination case at the best of times in front of a late panel, but if you bring the charter into it, it's, it's a real problem and obfuscation and just scares them away. So um, the, the, the effort and the focus is on, on, on human rights rather than uh, uh, the charter itself. So where um, 
coming to the, my fourth point, coming to the conclusion that Oaks is a good test, why do I like it so much if I haven't actually used it in practice um, in a long time? And um, I guess this leads me to my fifth point and, and how I get to the topic of, of the paper I will write, um, is because we use the principles of Oaks outside um, charter litigation. And the Oaks framework, that elegant balancing framework, has um, proved a very helpful guide in other contexts. And in particular, when dealing with privacy rights in the employment context, is the one that I, um, I've been dealing with quite a bit. And um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, in, in the workplace, it, it's, it's the area we're litigating now is privacy rights. And um, one example is employers wanting to get um, employees' uh, personal medical information. It's a case, an arbitration award, um, several of them, but one that explicitly adopts the Oaks analysis out of Alberta, um, where the employers were requiring um, employees to sign very intrusive medical consent forms when they wanted medical information, saying, give us your diagnosis, let us contact your doctor directly in writing, let us phone your doctor directly uh, to find out your medical information, and so forth. And um, the, the um, arbitrator said, well, you know, really this is, let's take a look at what Oaks says and apply it to this context. You know, employer, what, what's your pressing and substantial objective? What's your objective for requiring this medical information? Is it to confirm that somebody's on sick leave or the other general areas because somebody's cl uh, claiming a right for you to accommodate? Okay, so those, either of those objectives are reasonable and, you know, justifiable. Um, so what's the rational connection between the type of information you're looking for and that objective? Well, you don't need to talk to their doctor. You don't even need their diagnosis. If it's sick leave, you just need um, to know that you're sick. If it's duty to accommodate, you need to know what, um, what the restrictions are, whether they're permanent or temporary. Okay, you don't usually need the diagnosis. You know, what's the best way to, what's the, what's the minimal uh, way to, uh, to achieve and obtain that information with minimal intrusion on your employee's rights? Well, calling the doctor is probably one of the most invasive ways. Um, you know, the minimal way is to um, ask the employee to provide that information. Um, and then, you know, you're doing the overall proportionality. So, I mean, very explicitly adopting the Oaks test in that type of a context, which I think ends up with the right result and makes it workable. And it's a way that you can explain to people and they understand that. The other area that we've seen um, the Oaks test uh, come alive is um, in the employment context is with video surveillance. And Pam Chapman, who teaches uh, uh, labor law and labor arbitration here, I think, um, was uh, also sits as an arbitrator and wrote one of the early decisions out of Ontario on applying the Oaks principles to evaluating whether to admit video surveillance. Um, again, surveillance verifying whether somebody was properly on sick leave or not. And asking those same types of questions. You know, what was the purpose? Is there a rational connection between the evidence you want to admit and what you say the purpose was? Was there a less intrusive means of determining that? And when you want to determine, you know, evaluate whether somebody's validly on sick leave, usually the easiest way is to ask them if they're sick. And then if that's not satisfactory, then maybe require medical, you know, say please provide us medical information. You know, an acknowledgement that uh, engaging in video surveillance and seeing, um, and being able to admit that at a hearing um, um, is kind of the last resort. And so, um, now that's not, that test isn't universally accepted by arbitrators, but it's been accepted across the country um, by a large chunk of arbitrators in terms of, let's take these principles, these, and I think uh, Pam Chapman talked about charter values imbuing um, um, our analysis and our respect for privacy. So um, those are just two of, of, of several examples I could give you from um, the employment context. We've seen um, the same types of analysis um, being used by privacy commissioners um, when they're dealing with the interpretation of their privacy statutes um, in particular. And again, not maybe not as explicitly talking about the Oaks test and Oaks principles, but um, implicitly adopting that framework for analysis in, um, uh, for the balancing of rights. And it's, I think it's, a, um, again, I think it's partly the, the elegance and the um, simplicity of what of, of the test 
that can be applied in so many different situations, but it helps you do that ultimate balance. Um, the, um, and, and so, um, see, Oaks is a wonderful development. I wish we could ever get to it in charter litigation, and maybe one day again we will. Um, and I say that as somebody who acts for, for usually uh, uh, people making charter challenges. And, um, you know, it's waiting for the right case. There's somebody had commented on Eldridge being uh, good facts, and law is all about the facts. And sometimes you can't choose your facts, but if we can find the right case, um, I, I'm, I'm firmly of the view that it, uh, it's a pendulum. And um, from a charter perspective, we're in a bad state. We're not quite so bad at human rights, but we're headed that way. And we get the right case, we'll show how bad it is, and then the pendulum will start to swing back the other way. So if you've got a good case and good facts, um, let's chat afterwards. <laughs> Thanks very much. Avant de passer la parole à l'audience, je vais demander à Martha et uh, Carissima s'il y, y a des commentaires. Hello, merci beaucoup. I just have a couple of very quick uh, comments to make. I feel like I'm hogging the, uh, the platform since I already got my GU Mambo at CS19, but it's hard <laughs> for a law professor to resist. <laughs> <laughs> So I teach the first year charter course here in the French Common Law Program. And I tell my students, I have been telling my students for a few years now, that there's yet to be a Section 15 sex equality victory for women in Canada. Men have won sex equality claims in Canada, but women have not. And there are complex reasons for that, but the most glaring one is actually Section 1. Now, there's nothing in justice Chief Justice Dixon's formulation of the Oaks test that should have caused us to worry that that might be the case. In fact, his, his articulation of the values underlying Section 1 that judges are meant to apply in, in interpreting it, I think are, are very feminist friendly and, and social justice friendly as well. But I think the minimum impairment requirement had within it the seeds of I guess, defeat for feminist social justice claims because very quickly the courts constitutionalized the distinction between positive and negative rights under guise of differential review at the minimal impairment stage. So if you as a victim of a charter rights violation were the singular antagonist of the state, aka a criminal accused, often in sexual violence cases, you were entitled to the most rigorous standard of Section 1 review. But if your rights violation involved a complex balancing of social policy and socio-economic rights-related considerations, well then, the standard of Section review became highly attenuated and we really looked for reasonableness. And as any feminist will tell you, as soon as you start using words like reasonableness and reasonable person, you, you, you start to worry about the kinds of presumptions and stereotypes that uh, will be fed into that. And so essentially when we were talking about negative rights claims where the violation of men's rights was occurring through state action, we have a rigorous application of section one where we have the violation of women's rights through state inaction, then you have an attenuated standard of review. And I think as I, I tried to argue this morning, in the current climate, both of deficit and debt that I described this morning, but also of a renewed, I think, Sometimes it looks neoliberal, sometimes it looks out and out Christian fundamentalist, I mean, depending on where you're standing, uh, a, a view of, of the welfare state, a view of that line between public and private, and even a view of the role of women within the market economy and within the family. Again, I, I have to say that there, there is a huge need for rigorous evidence-based review uh, at every single stage of the Section 1 Oaks analysis. 
And unfortunately, the NAEP decision shows us that that is not something that we can automatically expect. And even the reasoning of Justice Binney in that case, why was it a minimum impairment? Because other choices, cutting or restricting other spending um, or other rights would be more socially disruptive than violating women's rights. And so we'll go with violating women's rights. And the result of that is that feminists, uh, I think litigators and organizations like LEAF are now seriously exploring Section 28, which is a provision that we ignored for a long time, for the very simple reason that Section 1 doesn't apply to Section 28. And I, I think that's going to become very important to do, but I'm really disappointed at the idea of having to give up on Section 1, because I think, I think Section 1 has a really important role to play within the Charter, as I mentioned before. It's a key social rights accountability mechanism, and there are times where I think women are reliant on, uh, uh, on Section 1 to protect their competing social interests. So I, I think that from a, a, a feminist and equality rights grounded perspective, Section 1 right now is in need of some serious uh, rehabilitation. So in, in putting together my somewhat scattered musings, I, I was trying to think uh, just in terms of the women angle, and I will come to talk about trying to make a couple of comments about other groups. So I was a lawyer at LEAF. I was staff lawyer and director of litigation between 1994 and 2001. And I tried to think of <coughs> cases where you had a classic female claimant making a Section 15 argument where we actually got to argue we actually got to the stage where the government had to justify whatever violation, the sex equality violation under Section 1. And I had a really difficult time thinking of those cases where A, you had the female claimant come forward and the Section 15 analysis was accepted so that you got to Section 1. Uh, the one case that I did, did happen in that time was a social assistance case called Faulkner, which I was actually privileged to um, argue uh, with. Martha, I was co-counsel, in the divisional court, and it then went up to the court of Ontario Court of Appeal, but it was an analogous ground. There was, there was a, some, a number of different uh, grounds under Section 15 that, was, um, that were being alleged there. That's, that's one case. Uh, another case is Thibodeau, which was not successful. That was a challenge to the Income Tax Act, uh, where you had this very dramatic gender split on the Supreme Court. The issue was uh, whether the fact that under the Income Tax Act, if you were, if you were paying uh, child support, you could deduct that, and then the custodial parent had to declare the the income. Was that, in fact, a, a, a denial of equality? And, and uh, the seven men on the court found that, excuse me, there were five men on the court found that it, it wasn't, and uh, two of the women found that it, it was. So I can't actually even think of classic Section 15 cases that went ahead involving women in my time at LEAF, and, and it's, it's interesting because that was a time when we were enjoying a lot of wins. But what were the wins uh, in relation to? Well, they were in relation to challenges to state programs that were actually meant to promote sex equality. And um, part of, I think, the undercurrent of this, of, of this particular panel is the general um, left progressive critique of the Charter, and I've always been uh, reminded of a very of, of a line that I read in an article by Elizabeth Shilton and Derek 20 years ago, responding to that critique. Right? Why should we even engage? Who cares? And they 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 wrote this line that I've never forgot. We cannot abjure the charter. The charter will not abjure us. And in fact, that is exactly what where most of our um, support, where most of our energies have gone. It's to these cases where we are the ones who are actually making the section one argument trying to bolster the Section 1 arguments. And uh, when you look at those cases, the way that it breaks down is really interesting. So these are claims, these are sex equality claims waged by men. So in a case with a very modest um, uh, differential treatment between male and female prison guards, that's the Conway case, uh, we won quite easily. 
of course, the, the classic counterexample is seawater, where in a, in a very detailed uh, Section 1 argument, the court essentially chastised Parliament for being too progressive with respect to women's equality rights um, in, in ensuring uh, that sex equality trials would be fundamentally fair. Um, so we, we've had a very different, a different experience under Section 1. I have noticed that in Section 1, it's a lot easier to win. If you, if you make out an equality violation, it's a lot easier to win if your claim is highly symbolic. If your claim is to enter an institution like marriage, or it's to enter the, the commons of society as a sort of a rational, autonomous person, where there's no attendant state cost, you have a much easier time, of course, than if you're challenging under-inclusion in, in social benefits schemes. The other thing I've noted with, with um, Section 15 claims is that clearly some groups are considered model minority groups, and others are, are clearly disfavored. So model minority groups, and I don't mean to disparage those groups at all, but a model minority group would be uh, the Sikh, uh, the, the minority Sikhs in Multani where the court went out of its way to talk about how there had never been an incidence of Kirpen-related violence. And this is a group that we can trust in terms of uh, guaranteeing their freedom, their religious exercise in this instance. Another case I would argue would be the gay and lesbian community in some of the challenges involving uh, marriage. Who are the disfavored minorities? The poor. Um, some, some religious groups that are seen as too exotic or, or, or different, I would argue the Hetarian uh, sect in Hetarian Brethren, and women, particularly Aboriginal women. And when you look at the way that the cases break out, it's very clear which groups are threatening and, and which are not. Um, finally, the one I, I did want to say with getting back to Section 1, that the trend in Section 1, starting with uh, Hetarian and continuing through Whitler, uh, which did not reach Section 1, but is to privilege, uh, in terms of a different standard of review, of review uh, large social programs or regulatory schemes. So that in Hetarian, the majority specifically said that accommodation, individual ta tailoring, was not an appropriate thing to be que questioning in a case where you have a program that is meant to apply generally, like the driver's licensing program. And in Whitler, not at the Section 1 stage, but at the Section 15 stage, the court was, in a sense, was finally open about the fact that uh, the government should have greater latitude to design these benefits programs without paying attention to the you know, minutia of uh, adverse impact on a group, groups like women. So there's, there, there are a lot of uh, different elements that have, that have gone into creating the incredible uh, historical fact, as Martha said, we have yet to have an actual true sex equality victory in the Supreme Court of Canada in a charter case. And um, I'm not at all convinced that, that uh, we will in the near future. Thank you. Merci bien. Um, questions from the floor? Um, while we're waiting for people to have questions, I'll just add my two cents worth, if it's okay. Um, I can't uh, help but agree with uh, uh, Ritu. Um, it, uh, it, it is perhaps not uh, uh, without significance that I'm now practicing human rights law, because in a sense, uh, I think I, as a, as a litigator, kind of agree with Professor Chatterjee when, uh, when, we, when he said, uh, who cares, the law is useless. Um, I have the, the dubious distinction of losing the Hodge case in the Supreme Court of Canada. Unfortunately, there were no interveners there. And it's part of the trilogy of Nathan and Hodge uh, that has perhaps landed us in a pretty precarious state uh, right now in terms of uh, uh, Section 15 and equality rights. So, say that uh, the trying to resist the importation of the Section 15 analysis into the human rights uh, is a, a, a significant challenge uh, right now. Uh, and uh, uh, we're working on it. So, yes. Hi. Um, I 
go from year to year with no one ever mentioning Section 28. So I thought. given the history of the section. So, so, so just to remind everyone how much this really hurts. Um, uh, section 28 um, was championed by um, the women's groups that eventually morphed into LEAF. Um, the um, political skill and energy um, and inventiveness of the group was amazing. The premiers fought tooth and nail against it. Um, one of the, the and eventually, um, of course, it was, it was included in the charter. Um, it, one of the reasons that it was um, so important to put it in was because Section 27 was included, which uh, um, is a, the, the interpretive section, which indicates that um, the uh, rights in the charter should be uh, interpreted consistent with the multicultural, multicultural heritage of Canadians, and of course. The women's groups thought that, quite rightly, that this would take away a lot of what they had thought that they had won <laughs> under Section 15. Now, um, one should actually think about the wording of Section 28 to realize how astounding it is that it hasn't been mentioned. It is actually the strongest section in the Charter because it has its own notwithstanding formula at the beginning. Um, it is not. Um, a rights guarantee, um, which might make it seem weaker, but it actually makes it much stronger because what it says is that all of the rights should be interpreted um, as um, providing um, uh, equality for men and women, so that it um, it applies to all the rights it's, and it's it's has its own notwithstanding clause. So it's a very very strong clause. Um, the other thing is that there was a strong battle as, whether, as to whether it would be subject to the override clause or not. And one of the things that came out um, in a conference I organized a few year, years ago on Section 15 was that they had actually printed two versions of the charter the day that the charter was being made public. And one had the override applying to Section 28 and the other didn't. And the, Trudeau made the decision the morning, I guess, on April 18th, um, which one it would be. And apparently the printer, the person who was in charge of printing, sort of had a nervous breakdown during the night because it was so stressful to be printing both of these versions. And so I think the story was that the lawyers had to go in and finish the printing. So the, so the story is amazing. Yeah. And so, and then, even in Morgenthaler, we, I remember reading Morgenthaler when it first came out, saying, okay, Dixon doesn't mention Section 50. Okay, one wouldn't expect Beds to. When Mayers is such a good lawyer and so strong our interpretation, surely he will. And then Wilson, nothing. And I, I couldn't believe it. Anyway, I just wonder what happened? Do people, do, like, I can't believe you're not arguing it in these cases. It can't, it, like, what is going on? <laughs> you're the director of litigation. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't the director of litigation when we were yeah. taller. I, I'm not sure. I think it might have been timing. I mean, the, the, the rules around intervention were extremely uh, narrow. And we might have just missed it. I mean, it's not, it's not, I mean, we certainly, to my knowledge, it never made a decision to not intervene in Morgan Tower, to my knowledge. Uh, just to, but, but in terms of the use of Section 28, so there is an We do okay. use Section 28. Yeah. We, we refer to it as, I mean, certainly at the time that I was at LEAF, we, we would routinely use it. It um, we just never got any traction on it whatsoever. I think, too, with Section 28, and, you know, in retrospect, it seems like a bit of a luxury to have thought that we could do this, but there was a lot of debate very early on within the feminist legal community about the essentialist character of that provision and a concern about arguing it. 
And so it was always argued in tandem with Section 15. And I, I think it's going to be very interesting and within the next year or so. We hope um, our colleague, uh, Carrie Frock, is actually doing a doctorate at Queen's right now on Section 28. And she's, she's looking at the legislative fed, the history. And I, I'm really looking forward to, to what she comes up with because she's interviewing people. And, you know, it was funny because it was, it was actually Gérard, the Sénateur Gérard Baudouin at a, a conference right after Nate who got up and said, you know, why didn't, why didn't you argue Section 28? You know, Nate, Nate wouldn't have happened. I don't actually believe that to be true whatsoever, but it, it is, I think that is the, the consequence of what the Section 1, Section 1 history now is that it's going to be, there's a lot of attention being paid to it now in the feminist legal community, and I think it, you know, I actually think it is, uh, it is a right guarantee, not necessarily just an interpretive provision, and hopefully it will. Maybe that'll be the next 30 years of the charter. We'll see some session. I mean, just to say as well that the courts don't like redundancy, what they might perceive as redundancy, and so you know, uh, it was a historical accident that Big M was argued as a, it was a contingent fact that Big M was argued as a freedom of religion case and not equality case. But where you have this overlap, I mean, it would it would be difficult to get the court to uh, to to see the case as under Section 28 and not Section 15 unless it actually involved the same right which was you know being denied to men and women which, which is one way to interpret what section 28 does great so um, i just take the opportunity to say thank you so much to you too for setting the tone here and then to uh, martha and carissima for really stepping up and providing a great context for us thank you.